everybody. My name is Ariel, and I am with the Dayton International Peace Museum here in the United States. I'm the administrative assistant slash volunteer coordinator, and today I am here with Tevin and Ayana. They are both volunteers for us, and we're going to be giving you the millennials perspective on how we can build peace for the future. And first, we're going to be chatting with Tevin on how technology can be used to spread peace. All Let's right. So, thank you, Ariel. So when it comes down to technology, um, my particular interest is really using or at least uh, investigating ways you can use technology for education. And to start off, I think there's a, a quote that is quite fitting uh, for this. And it goes, an educated man is not necessarily one who has an abundance of general or specialized knowledge. An educated man is one who so has developed the faculties of his mind to acquire anything he wants without violating the rights of others. So with that being said, I think tech is one of the greatest tools we can use to educate ourselves. So as far as peace museums and uh, using tech as a vehicle for peace, I think self-education um, is, is a pretty good start. Um, in fact, ignorance is, is quite costly, um, in, in many, in many ways. Um, so for tech, it would be cool if museums offered maybe internet cafes or open tech spaces where people could come in and use the space, or I don't know, maybe even host like, uh, tech, workshops, just teaching people who may feel afraid of tech, especially since it's always updating and they're all, people are always adding new features. Um, just if people felt like they didn't have the basics down, maybe hosting workshops where they could, uh, you know, feel proficient enough to apply for jobs, send email, get the basics down. And then if they wanted to keep learning, um, they would be empowered to keep going from then, uh, keep going from there. Um, other than that, thank you. Um, That's other a great that, idea. Yeah. And actually, I, we do at our museum, we do tell people that they are able to come in and use the internet and things like that. Okay. Um, but I don't think it's really something we've really promoted or marketed. So I think that could be a great thing for us going forward. You know, once we are able to safely reopen is to advertise that more. And I love the idea of having the workshops and and teaching people because a lot of people don't have those skills, especially, um, you know, here in Dayton, we do have quite a disparity and a lot of those before COVID, at least children did probably did not have very much access to technology to use in their personal time. So really being able to kind of give a space for people to learn how to use those things, especially for things like searching for jobs and um, things like that is super important. Creating a resume. Um, those are really great, great ideas to implement. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. And, you know, with the whole uh, COVID situation, I think um, uh, the, the disparity in terms of how proficient people actually um, are able to use technology is, is really starting to show. Um, there's a lot of parents who are now essentially teaching assistants or taking on the full role of the teacher, especially while some schools remain closed. And that is quite a responsibility to take on. And if you don't even know how to use the basic functions of the laptop, your student may be getting sent home with. And that could be a very stressful and uncomfortable situation to be in and you still need to make sure ultimately your child's work is getting done and there's just a, a, such a high barrier to even get that done when you don't have the skills you need so. and i've actually seen how internet cafes and how having access to those type of resources really transforms a community and it really makes the people feel as though there are more possibilities around them. So that's a, a really, I think, a great idea of how to promote peace at your museum. I agree. And also, Tevin, I know before you have mentioned how fast 
technology updates and it does yes. make it cheaper. So does that make also make it easier for people in more disparity areas get access to that? So for the most part, yes. Um, actually, there's something called Moore's Law, which is pretty much that every two years, uh, computational processing power doubles. And as processing power increases, price goes down. So at this point, you can get a solid 4G smartphone, um, maybe 60 bucks. And if you're talking about an impoverished area or even a third world country, that's bringing that cost down enough to start getting the tech to those underserved communities. Um, so yes, there is always going to be new tech rolling out, but with those areas that are underrepresented now, you know, you don't necessarily need to have a Best Buy or, you know, a designated tech store to get access. And I think that's opening uh, entirely new markets, really, in terms of uh, what technology can be used for. Um, and particularly since those communities haven't uh, historically had access to internet and, and um, you know, affordable tech, there's actually a market being created in this space just to serve those people. And I think pretty soon a lot of uh, tech companies and app developers and so forth will jump on that. Um, and it would be cool, actually, if, if Peace Museums um, somehow could uh, get more involved in that space as well, even if it's um, more of like a philanthropic, a philanthropic application of, of technology. Um, because uh, again, it just it all goes back to education and teaching. Like that's it's so powerful. And once people get that, they can take their Li they can take the reins of their lives back in their own hands. Like they're unstoppable by them. Like, and so I think it's basically just now the logistics of actually making that happen. It's easy, of course, to talk about something, but to actually bring that to fruition, um, there would be quite a bit of planning there um, because technology for the most part is still driven by competition and, and capitalism. So there are going to be certain drawbacks, but for the most part, um, I, I think, if people, tech companies, nonprofits such as the, the Dayton Peace Museum, if they became aware of, um, of of the impact of what technology can afford uh, or can could lead to for people, um, I think it would really be a win-win. So great. So really, technology can help spread peace by giving people the access to education to being able to find job security and uh, what other ways do you think that it can can help spread peace in other than those ways um well i uh i don't have an actual uh, statistic for this but it is kind of um, a popular ideology that um, the more educated you are, the less violence there is in your community. So just having those things, I think, are going to have uh, sort of like a, a trickle-down effect on, on violence and on poverty. Uh, a lot of those baseline metrics that make, those, um, that make certain communities of lower income um, taboo or too risky for for most businesses to pursue um which again that ultimately gives the power back to the people who live in those communities because through technology they could start their own businesses they could start their their own culture or in whatever direction they care to take it that's great so now we are going to switch gears and we're going to chat here with ayana and Ayana, you had some great ideas on how peace museums and everybody can peacefully contribute to social change. Yes, thank you, Ariel. Um, I feel it as though it's important to establish uh, what truly contributes to peace. And I believe that each individual has a duty to honor themselves. And when those needs aren't being met, that's when instability in our health and our emotions tends to arise, and which leads to an unhappy self. And when this is happening, 
on a grand scale and you have a collective group of unhappy selves, right, it leads to systemic chaos. <laughs> and I really feel as though uh, society tends to gleam a negative light on millennials who like to express the importance of self-care, um, taking care of their mental health, their emotional health, um, making their focus about how they feel in a moment, what a situation, uh, how a, a situation makes them react. Um, but this is not something negative. This is not millennials being selfish. This is not just me, me, me. In turn, I think it's actually a way that uh, it's starting at the root of the issues that we are experiencing here as a human family. And um, it starts even in your own home. You can tell, you know, if, if one person is having a really gloomy day and, and they start off on the wrong side of the bed, you know, that can triple and, and, and affect your whole household. <laughs> you know, that energy, everybody can feel that. So I think that one way that museums can promote peace is to encourage visitors to look within themselves and provoke individuals to practice emotional intelligence and mindfulness. Uh, that can be done by creating a special exhibit where questions that people really need to be asking themselves a lot more uh, in order to practice these concepts are made visual. You know, for an example, uh, when was the last time I hugged myself? You know, that, that might sound strange or, or, or be an out there uh, question, but it's, it is important. It's important to give yourself grace under difficult circumstances, cultivate more self-compassion. And I think if we create reminders for community members or people to be more compassionate towards themselves, um, many of the violent and just tragic and unjust outbursts that we see going on um, can definitely be minimized, you know, and I think that we have to promote that um, as community leaders and community members. We have to promote that self-compassion and and really show others that it's really safe to love ourselves. And, you know, thus then we can teach others that it's safe to love each other, you know, because if you're comfortable with your own emotions and how you feel and expressing yourself, you can spread that. You know, you can teach your children how to be that way. You can teach them to stick up for others. And I mean, if each and every one of us just stood up for one another in a lot of the situations we experience, I mean, that would be a completely transformational in itself. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, I love how you kind of switch the the script on the millennial perspective. Because, you know, we get that a lot. Oh, millennials are so selfish. They're so selfish. But honestly, in my journey here uh, with the museum, I've realized that really peace starts with each individual. And like you said, if you can't love yourself, I mean, how can you expect somebody else to love you? So really embracing yourself and learning to accept yourself and let yourself heal. Um, that's super powerful. It is. And I mean, when you're not accepting yourself, that's an energy you're carrying around. And so when you're dealing with others, you're going into work and you're not liking the way that you feel. You're not liking the way you look or you think that oh, I hate that I woke up late this morning. Just all of those things translate into little ways that you're eking out negative vibes out into yeah. others. Yeah. You know, and everybody can feel that. And and I think it's just really important to start with the self, practice mind mindfulness, meditation, start understanding, okay, this uncomfortability that I'm feeling, maybe it's not my co-worker who just chats on all the time and I'm trying to do my work like you know maybe it's not them maybe it's the fact that I didn't even allow myself to get a good enough rest at night because I thought you know just all of those things they you know it affects just one us. more episode or <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the biggest one of the biggest forms of self-care is getting good sleep and because mm, that's so important um not to mention also food but um, really just taking a step back and realizing that hurt people hurt people. So, you know, if somebody's being rude to you, you can reflect and say, you know, is that true? And is that something that maybe they need some grace right now Absolutely. instead of reacting back to that? Absolutely. That reaction 
activity is often what really gets us in trouble and and, and ends up hurting um, people in ways that we really didn't mean to. But that's what mindfulness really helps us um, to learn is how to stop ourselves before re- we react, you know, violently or outbursting. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we can even kind of translate some of what Tevin was talking about with the the community groups almost. You can, there's all kinds of ways that peace museums can create different forms of community groups to to impact people's lives in, in every area of your life, whether that be, um, you know, technology, whether that be health and wellness, or, um, you know, talking about meditation, exercise classes, how to cook a, a meal. I mean, there's so many people in America who literally do not know how to cook a basic meal. And that's something I've become so passionate about lately and really learning how to, to really just get these groups together and when you're in community with people, how much of a change that can impact on people when you have somebody there with you to, to go through the process and know that you're not alone. Absolutely. I read a a quote earlier that said, um, humans only get through, only survive difficult circumstances by coming together, not by um, being separate. You know, and so, I mean, Facebook is doing a really good job um, going back to technology of bringing people together of similar interests. You know, if you want to start a meditation uh, group virtually, they have various (laughs) kinds of of groups that you can join for those types of things. And um, I believe that museums can really take a hold of that benefit and bring people together in, in order just to cultivate a sense of we are here you know, and you're not alone and you can reach out. Yeah. I love that. That's awesome. Tevin, did you have any input? Um, yes, just <laughs> kind of, uh, I mean, you guys have said a lot of great things, but, um, in, in that same light, uh, I think when people, you know, talk about men- millennials specifically, there is, uh, almost a stereotype that, you know, all we do is spend time in front of a screen. Um, we don't get outside much. We, you know, don't know how to interact with one another. We're depressed. Um, so there, you know, I, and even as a technologist, I have to admit that there are some uh, darker side of darker realities of technology that we do have to be mindful of, especially in times like these. Um, as you mentioned, Ayana, yes, people are definitely uh, better off um Uh, uh, coping when they can interact together as a group and during these times i think you know even if it is a virtual meeting every once in a while that uh can can have quite a benefit uh a positive benefit on one's psyche uh having a stable well-being um and that's that's super important um but even so um there not every millennial knows how to use uh, a phone you know that's that's Guilty. a misconception. I know basics. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and you know, uh, I, I actually, I'm an Android user, but um, one of the reason that, uh, reasons that Apple became such a popular product with their phones and laptops is how intuitive it is. Um, yes, I, I the user that, interface is so easy to grasp. <laughs> absolutely, and I think that's uh, that's kind of uh, that'll be big for people who do reach out to um, communities or people uh, of people who aren't so uh, tech savvy is that it's intuitive. It's easy to grasp. Um, you keep that learning curve as, as small as possible so that people feel like they actually can grab their, wrap their hands around it. Uh, or, you know, you don't want people to feel like tech is this awesome thing that only a, a select few people get access to like it's really for everybody the trick is learning how to make it as accessible as possible that's awesome well we do need to start wrapping up and i want to just talk about how peace museums can make peace achievable for everybody who um, interacts with your individual museum because um, when i when i first found the museum I was thinking peace is, you know, you think of peace is just this insanely huge 
completely unachievable goal that you feel like there's no possible way that you could have an impact on it. Um, but like we've touched on is that really peace starts with each individual person. So I feel like it is so important that every person who comes to your museum, maybe visits your website, your social media, they're learning things that they can apply to their life to bring more peace into their life right now. Something easy, achievable, give them baby steps with things like the communities that we've talked about, you know, learning how to fill out an application, uh, learning how to cook a healthy meal, learning um, simple basic exercises or, um, you know, giving, teaching people how to do basic finances. Um, all of these little things can really make a huge impact on people's lives. And it's so important for people to realize that, you know, when you learn those things, it's going to directly impact the people in your family. And that's going to start impacting your neighbors, your community. And it really just ripples out um, across the world. And it's, it's really all it takes is each of these little baby steps um, to, to reach the end goal. You know, um, all of the wars and genocide and everything that happened is super important for museums to continue to cover. But I also feel like um, people need to be given context on what they can do about it, you know, whether that be reaching out to politicians or, um, you know, filling out petitions or just, you know, the peaceful protests that are around or, you know, just give people context of something that they can do about it so that they they also feel something like they're achieving something in their life and really giving people a reason why we do those things. So we do um, weekly meditations, at least we did before COVID. And a lot of people might think that meditation is some hippie thing that, that's not for me. But if people learned how big of an impact meditation has on your life, I mean, it's it's so important. It's completely changed my life. And I really feel like it's so important and it's a basic skill that people can do for free in their own home, own home. And they have access, you know, if they have internet access, there's so many resources on YouTube, there's apps, there's so many things that we can, that we have access to that, that a lot of people probably don't know about. So I feel like that's going to be our job as a museum is getting that information out to people so that they can bring peace to themselves so that it can radiate out into the community. Absolutely. Really well said, Ariel. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin, did you have anything? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, with meditation, um, I, I thought about meditation apps and how, you know, there, if, if that's something you really want to learn, um, it's more so the mindset that it will work um because at this point you know you there's definitely uh there's all these youtube videos about uh meditation there's guided meditations there's apps on the phone like i i, I just mentioned uh you mentioned how the peace museum uh used to host those workshops or you know meditation sessions um but for people to actually uh, adopt those practices it all starts with the beliefs systems they have like knowing they can do it it works um and it's sustainable uh, going back to peace um i think people have this predisposition towards peace as being some unrealistic utopia in which everyone is happy and nothing bad happens like there's no problems left in the world um, but when i think of peace it's, it's more so about uh striving towards something more sustainable um how can you make things better it doesn't have to be perfect just you know making things better as you go forward if if we are constantly pushing ourselves constantly evolving improving our processes in which we uh, conduct ourselves um, you know being more mindful about uh, the collective and not just the individual you know I, I think we'll we'll be okay as a, as a species so yeah, yeah. that's great <laughs> well we are all out of time. Uh, thank you both for um, going through this process with me and and doing this with me today. Uh, I hope 
everybody who is watching took away some notes that they can use and implement in their museums. And we hope you guys have a great rest of the year. Bye.